Hey, did you guys realize that there are other RPG systems than D&D? &D? I mean, like, it's insane, I know, but there are other game developers creating other games with different mechanics. And all sarcasm aside, I know that there is a large majority of the TTRPG community who just plays D&D, &D, and within that bubble, I think that you are missing some things. So today, I'm going to highlight three mechanics from other RPG systems that I think are just great. The first of these mechanics are the progress clocks from Evil Hat Productions, Blades in the Dark, and Band of Blades. Essentially, to use this mechanic, just draw a circle and segment it into at least four pieces. Generally, the most you do is like 12. And these clocks can measure so many things. They can measure simple obstacles or maybe like danger. I use these progress clocks for stealth missions a lot because if you fail one stealth roll, you don't want it to completely screw up for stealth mission. So that's why you might use something like an awareness clock where you have maybe six pieces of this circle and then for each one that's filled in, the level of alarm that the guards have increases. You can also use these clocks to keep track of quests. Because sometimes, particularly in sandbox campaigns, you'll have players just have quests sit there forever. But with quest clocks, they can see, oh, like the time to do this quest it has basically passed. Or you could do long-term project clocks. Like maybe you want to build a castle, you have a 12 segmented clock, and then slowly count down over sessions. Or you can do something more esoteric, like getting a populace to love your adventuring party. Whatever the case, clocks are a unique and dynamic system that I'm trying to implement more and more into my D&D games. Next, we're going to look at the Tower from Dread. Dread is a horror RPG that doesn't have any die rolls. It uses what is essentially a Jenga tower to tell its story. And I think mixing D&D with this tower system is exquisite. Essentially in Dread, Every time you are attempting to do something, you pull from the tower. If the tower collapses, your character dies. Now in D&D, it might not be death, it might be getting knocked to unconsciousness or something bad happening, but the general premise is there. I found mixing the tower with regular D&D dice rolls on high importance missions just raises the tension to astronomical levels. And because I'm an asshole, I also make sure to have my players roll on the exact same table that the Jenga tower's on. Because then, every roll has the possibility of just knocking over the tower still. It's devious, I know, but it's just the little things that really give you joy as a DM. And really, this tower is such a good representation of dread. The Each pull of a block is signifying moving closer and closer to doom and destruction. And mixing this mechanic into regular D&D &D basically means that you don't have to go towards destruction, but the players have their fate in their own hands, literally. I don't break it out all the time, but when I do, I love it. And I highly recommend using it in the most unique and creative situations as you can. I've always wanted to use the Dread system to roleplay like a ballroom or like a diplomatic meeting. Every action the players take has to be highly calculated and precise because it's political and diplomatic in nature. But then they can feel the tension of the night or the event growing until they make one false move and everything collapses. But now let's shift to the fate system. And I know a lot of people don't like the fate system, they think it's too open, but I think that this particular function of it is fantastic. You see, in combat in the fate system, you break the combat into these zones. When characters are in zones, they can basically fight each other. Usually in fate, you can draw zones out on a map or you can just use index cards. And I think that this is a quick and easy way to set up combats in D&D 5th edition. Obviously, you have to do just a little bit of fiddling like maybe a fireball encapsulates the entirety of one zone, for instance. But it really streamlines combat. You're not looking for how much you can move, you're looking for how can I get into this zone? Is this zone too far away for me to get to? Or other questions like that. It's also good if you're a DM without many terrain resources and you're just looking for ways to make easier combats for yourself. All you have to do is build out these basically zone index cards and you're done. It also works extremely well for theater of the mind. 
if you have a group that does do theater of the mind, this is fantastic. You can just put these little coins or tokens or whatever on the index cards and that's all you really need. It's just one simple static piece that adds so much to your combats. For me, the way I convert zones into 5th edition is that one move action moves you one zone over. If you take the dash action, you can move two zones. AoE spells fill up usually one zone, or, you know, DM fiat here. You generally describe what an AoE could hit and what it could not hit. With zones, you're playing loose and fast with distance so that you don't get bogged down in too many mechanics. I also really like using zones in sandbox campaigns, because this way you can pretty much DM on the fly if the party walks into the cave that you've just been describing, you can write out the different portions of the cave on note cards and go from there. It makes it super easy to run a sandbox campaign. And if you want more tips on how to run a sandbox campaign, might I suggest this video right here, and thank you for entering the dungeon.